forum chairs and general chairs, they, they don't get any money, right? So they do this work all for free. They do it as a service to the community. And in order to appreciate and to show the appreciation for the work they do, um, there used to be a tradition several years ago that the, the, the president of the ICR was handing over certificates to the certificates of appreciation to the general chairs and, and, and the program chairs. Then we, there was a certain gap in this tradition, so I would like today with this conference, because I think it's a good starting point to, to start again with this tradition. So we have the largest chess conference ever. We have a new journal model that we use. We have a new publication model with a, let's say, a record of submissions. We have a, a record of accepted papers. So I'd like to use this opportunity to restart this tradition. And so I would ask uh, Peter and Elena to come to the stage. So we start. I we'll start with Elena. So, so I'm not the president of ICR, but I'm the chair of the steering committee, and so I, I also feel to be able to hand over certificates. So I'll do that tonight. So, on behalf of the ICR, in fact. Um, so the Certificate of Appreciation reads, so the International Association for Cryptologic Research gratefully acknowledges Elena Buhan for her contribution to the worldwide community on cryptographic hardware and embedded systems through her role as General Chair of CHESS 2018. So thanks so much for your effort. So I have another one here. So the International Association for Cryptologic Research and gratefully acknowledges Peter Schwabe for his contribution to the worldwide community on cryptographic hardware and embedded systems through his role as general chair of CHESS 2018. <laughs> and as it's not... So this is for the wall. And we also have something to drink. So this is a Koran wine, so I'm told this is a local speciality. So I'm handing over this. So thanks again. All right. So Peter and Elena, so they're responsible for the place, the food. And of course, we also have a program. And so I'd like to ask the program chairs to come to the stage, uh, Daniel Page and Mathieu Revin. So. so we decided, when was it actually? One and a half years ago or something like that, or yeah, almost two meanwhile. Yeah, so, so we decided, so, to switch to the journal model, right? So they already accepted to be PC chair. They, at the time of accepting, you didn't know that we changed the model, right? So they accepted being program chairs and they thought that there will be only one deadline. And then uh, afterwards, at some point, I sent them an email, you know, would you also be willing to do three and to do a completely new model and then and, and change everything? And I, I'm very glad that, that you have been the first PC chairs to do this. I think you did a tremendous job. So we have a very successful number of, of, uh, of submissions and, uh, and accepted papers. So thanks a lot for this excellent job. So I start with Daniel. So you meanwhile know the text probably, but uh, there is a slight change at the end. So the International Association for Cryptologic Research gratefully acknowledges Daniel Page for his contribution to the worldwide community on cryptographic hardware and embedded systems through his role as program chair of CHESS 2018. Thanks so much. And we have yet another one. So the International Association for Cryptologic Research gratefully acknowledges Mathieu Revin for his contribution to the worldwide community on cryptographic hardware and embedded systems through his role as program chair of CHESS 2018. So, and also for the program chairs, something to relax afterwards when the conference is over, so to have a good glass of wine.
And with this, I'm already at the end of this introductory part, so I will hand over actually to the program chairs to, so that they can tell you what they did as their work, so that the number of submissions that they received and the effort they had in getting all the re re so, uh, reviews from, from, the PC, uh, yeah, from the PC and sub reviewers. Okay, so that's it. As you see, the um, grant session is professionally handled, and um, we are happy to, uh, to have such a good start, and we'll continue like that. <laughs> oh, that's a good start. Okay, so the IACR guidelines say we should actually do two things. Uh, they tell us what to do. Uh, the first is that we need to present entertaining statistics. This is a, a quote. And the second is to present the uh, best paper awards. And actually, we're not going to do either of those things, it turns out, because we decided to present the best paper award before the best paper presentation on Wednesday morning. And neither Mathieu or I are very funny. I don't even know what statistics are, actually, let alone entertaining statistics. So we just, yeah, that's, that's not going to work out so well either, probably. But maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh, because, well, Stefan already took the points here in, in, a, in a way, but this is a special year for Chess. Uh, it's the 20th edition. Uh, he didn't mention that, actually, uh, which is a good landmark, uh, although that's making me feel uh, quite old now. Uh, but also a record-breaking edition in almost every respect. The most important, well, from our perspective, I guess, the most important thing was that actually this is the first edition under a new hybrid publication model. And we wanted to spend maybe a little bit longer than normal telling you about how this model looks and how it worked out in the first year, because I think this is important for, for everyone, really. So the move to the new publication model was a decision taken by the Chair Steering Committee, uh, I guess, in 2017, mid-2017 yeah. sometime. Um, and essentially, this follows the, the lead of uh, FSE, who transitioned to the transactions on uh, symmetric cryptography. So we now have all of the publications or the papers accepted and published uh, at CHES appear in the uh, T-CHES journal. And there's a few uh, important differences, therefore, uh, versus CHES as was. The first is that this is a gold open access journal. So the publications are available to everyone almost immediately. Uh, 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 in a way as soon as they're, they're ready. So actually, if you go to the TCHES website, all of the papers are available now, uh, and we're before the co conference in actual fact. One important thing to point out here is that actually, uh, it's in everyone's collective interest to use the papers published uh, there as the definitive source, because uh, in certain, uh, like it or not, uh, the, the sort of reputation of the journal in it essentially depends on, on, on this somehow. So we sort of encourage you to do, to, to, to do that. The journal is managed by Bochum and in particular Tim, who acts as the managing uh, editor very effectively. The other difference is that uh, Teachers journal uh, operates uh, uh, four submission deadlines per year. So this means four review processes per year, although in this first year we've only used three of those. Uh, because getting it started, there was a, a sort of lead into that, obviously. So if CHES happens in year end, actually, the T CHES submission process starts in year end uh, minus one, so the, 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 the previous uh, year. In order to uh, do the work associated with those four review processes, obviously, we have uh, uh, reviewers, uh, and in particular, the T CHES editorial board, who act as the analogy to the uh, uh, CHES program committee. Uh, which is led by the co-editors-in-chief, uh, which, again, is the analogy of the CHES uh, program chairs uh, as was. Other than that, the review processes themselves are relatively the same as they were. There's just four of them. For example, they include a rebuttal uh, phase still. 
But one major difference is that there's now a richer set of decisions that the uh, editors and I guess the reviewers can, can uh, arrive at. So rather than just accept and reject papers, for instance, we now have the option to have uh, a major revision, which is essentially saying this is an, inv an invited resubmission. So an example of this would be where the reviewers have identified something that they want to champion, but also uh, they've identified some deficiencies such as it's not ready for publication quite, quite yet. And overall, the ethos is that we're able to take these papers that may have been rejected before and hopefully improve them so that they're subsequently accepted. And I think actually the, the statistics uh, bear out that that's worked out uh, well. Okay, so now a few words on uh, this year editorial, editorial board, so or what we called before program committee. Um, so um, while selecting and sending invitation for a program committee, uh, we try to take several criteria into account. Of course, the most important criteria is expertise to cover all the um, uh, topics uh, in the range of chess. But uh, then we also try to uh, balance uh, and bring diversity. Um, so here are some criteria. So um, in the end, our uh, the program committee was composed of uh, 53 members plus the two of us. And um, there was so like a majority um, coming from Europe, but I guess that's, that's a bias um, which re reflects as well the, uh, the audience and, and probably the publication as well. Um, we have also um, tried to balance uh, academia versus industry, though we have uh, some bias towards academia. We also attempted to, to balance uh, two other criteria, uh, which are experience and gender. So um, uh, we tried to promote young people and manage to absorb a third of, of um, people who had no experience in a ISCR PC before. Um, and I think it, it, it worked well. And we also tried to balance gender, and maybe we did a poor job uh, toward that, but um, it, it's still an, an improvement over some previous years, and, and we think we should try to push that forward. Um, so here is um, uh, some overview of the program. So we have, like for the fourth edition, I think, a challenge this year that um, started um, in a few months ago, and that so you'll have some wrap-up of the challenge um, later in the, during the room session. Uh, we had two parallel tutorial sessions on Sunday and two invited presentations, one from Academia this morning and another one from Industry tomorrow morning. Uh, three poster sessions, so the first one was just before the room session and uh, the two next one will be um, during the uh, coffee breaks, the morning coffee breaks. Uh, for the two next days. Uh, one room session, which will start uh, very soon. Uh, 15 technical sessions with 47 paper presentations, which make 25 hours of fun, um, which is a pretty dense program, but hopefully we'll make it uh, uh, to Thursday. Okay, so now our, a few statistics. So first, um, uh, submissions and accepted papers all over the years since the beginning of chess. So uh, as it was already said, um, uh, this year has no record in terms of number of uh, submissions and accepted papers. Um, so we can also observe that we have um, a steady um, acceptance rate around 25% for now more than 10 years. So. Uh, Although we had a, a new model, we didn't actually try to constrain um, the, this acceptance rate, and it naturally um, keeps to around 25%. So now if you look um, issue-wise, so um, we are fearing not having enough submission to the first uh, issue, but actually we received a, a, a third of what is a good year for chess usually. So, uh, that was a, a good start. 
Um, we, we got the, um, the same number of submissions, more or less, to the second issue, and then it doubled to the third issue. In terms of acceptance rate, um, it was also, uh, it remained around 25%, more or less. And, and we also had about 20% of major revisions yeah, for each issue. Okay, so regarding uh, region-wise statistics, so we also see here um, uh, strong involvement of Europe uh, in terms of number of submissions, but uh, even more in terms of uh, accepted submissions. If we look at uh, the country-wise submissions, so uh, most um, of the submissions are uh, with affiliations from different countries. Uh, then we have uh, um, the leading submitting countries are US and China, and then the leading uh, publishing countries are European and France. Belgium and, and Germany. So then if we look at the statistic in terms of number of authors, we see that we have a, um, a kind of Gaussian with a mean um, a bit higher than three authors per submission and per accepted submissions. There doesn't seem to be a bias with the number of authors per submission. And if we look at some other statistics on possible bias, um, we see that uh, we, had, we have about 20% of submission that co-authored at least one PC members, and which um, uh, achieve a, a, um, a bit higher uh, acceptance rate. And, and also long papers, although we just received a few, uh, achieve a, um, a better acceptance rate. And, and what, what is important here is to, to emphasize that uh, major revision uh, achieve a like, very good acceptance rate, so it means it's, it's, um, um, it's paying to, to take into account the, the remarks from the reviewers and to resubmit your work. Yeah, so uh, when Brexit happens, I have to find somewhere new to live and pr probably a new job, therefore. So I decided to become a data scientist, uh, which in my mind at least means sort of just writing Python scripts and saying something interesting about the output. So we tried to fish around for what data sets we could feed into my Python scripts. And yeah, th this, this is kind of the outcomes, I guess. The first is we, I, I think this, I've seen this happen a lot, so I guess it's uh, uh, traditional, is that this is a plot of the submissions over time. Uh, and what you can see, well, maybe, maybe this wasn't obvious, but uh, the majority of the submissions come in the last two days before the deadline. So probably sort of two-thirds of the submissions in the last two days, let's say. So I mean, shame, shame on you for being so disorganized, perhaps. <laughs> uh, if you look at the, so these three deadlines, uh, well, the middle of the de uh, deadlines fall just after the Christmas vacation. And interestingly, the... Uh, sort of trajectory of the curve there is a little bit steeper, so everyone's enjoying their Christmas vacation, and then suddenly, suddenly they're rushing to uh, submit the papers, perhaps. We looked at the earliest submission, which was 12 days before uh, a deadline. That was uh, issue two, so if that was you, congratulations on being so organized. Uh, everyone hates, hates you now. Uh, the latest submission was seven seconds before the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> So if, if that was you, congratulations on being so lucky or so brave. I'm not, I'm not sure which. We also did a, a word cloud of the uh, titles of the submissions. So uh, I'm not sure there's so much interesting to say about this, but it's sort of reassuring that hardware and attacks are, are popular in, in, in the submission titles. So this is all the submissions overall. If you look at the submission titles that are accepted, uh, there's not so much uh, change necessarily, but apparently papers about long papers are, 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 are popular. <laughs> the, the reason for this is that it's sort of mandated that if you write a long paper, then long paper should be in the title of your long paper. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is where I fail to get the job as a data scientist, I would say. And then the last thing we did was do a histogram of a uh, number of characters in uh, the reviews and also in the title of the papers. So the reviews, uh, I think, is interesting because what you can see, this is the left-hand side. Uh, the right-hand side of that plot shows that there's a few reviews actually bordering on sort of 10K uh, of plain text. So 
I mean, those reviewers either really loved or really hated that paper that they're reviewing, but I think this is kind of a, a, a good uh, thing to say about the effort that some reviewers put into the, the process, and we, we should, I think, be thankful for that. The mean is, yeah, around uh, 2K or so. What's interesting about this is that the minimum review length, which was 109 characters, is actually uh, less than the maximum title length of the paper, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, 142 characters. <laughs> and again, with my new data scientist job hat on, I was a bit panicked about this. What, what was my bug in my Python script? Um, I mean, 142 characters title is, is impressive. I, I think the next obvious step is that you put the whole, uh, whole paper in the title and sort of uh, uh, avoid the, the page limit some, somehow. But I, I looked into this, and actually, and actually the, the reason is that, uh, yeah, this very short review wasn't a, a negative or bad review in actual fact. They were just so impressed with the major revision, they said this is all, all fine and everything can go through. So in actual fact, this, 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 this isn't the problem. Uh, or joke that it first appears, fortunately for everyone, I think. So the last thing to say is that uh, hopefully it's obvious that a huge amount of effort goes into the, well, everything that you uh, see and hear uh, at CHES 2018. Um, we wrote a detailed preface to the T-CHES 2018 uh, edition uh, that tries to capture uh, everyone involved, um, most of whom are, are listed on the slides here, but we'd like to sort of finish off by really saying thanks a lot for all their hard efforts, and hopefully you can give them a round of, of applause uh, alongside us. I, I didn't think it would be that loud. So. I can now officially and deftly uh, declare the rump session open. <laughs> Have fun. Okay, um, a few words about the rump session. Uh, the rump session is the first time that either Daniel and I are chairing a rump session and uh, we came to realize that this is um, very long process, so uh, we had the submission, opened the submission uh, site for that, and we received uh, 22 submissions, including some that came in unofficial ch channels, uh, channels, side channels, Daniel says. Um, we, uh, the committee reviewed all of the submissions, and we had to decide which one to accept and which to reject. Uh, fortunately for uh, Americans, we had decided to accept all American submissions. <laughs> um, we also accepted all other submissions, so uh, we have 22 presentations today. Um, the presentations are time limited. Uh, look at the uh, RAMP session program to know how long your presentation is. If you don't know your, where you are presenting, now is the time to look. Uh, if you run over the time, you will have to compete with a gong. So with this, uh, we start the first presentation. All right. Go ahead. All right, thanks everyone. I'm honored to have been selected from Canada. I guess we fall in the Americas. We've made the, uh, the cut. So I'm gonna talk to you about embedded hardware blockchain and concrete security metrics to help you understand this uh, important problem. <laughs> I'll give you a quick motivation, some background on hardware blockchain, and then looking at embedded hardware blockchain and the differences here. So blockchain solves a lot of problems. Primarily, um, if you have money and you need to give it to IBM, they'll take your money for the IBM blockchain platform. If you have voting boosts, you can solve that. If you want to go to a thousand attendee conference, like what is Ches doing here, you can go to the blockchain conference, and I'm sure it's great. And you can also do cool stuff like store cryptocurrency on vaults. And you might have a really great one like this ASIC vault, so not to be confused with the, you know, the more uh, robust vaults maybe that sponsor this uh, conference here, let's say. Um, ASIC vault does this great idea. It's a thousand times stronger security. Um, and if you read through it, what you see is they've hardware accelerated the key derivation function. It's a thousand times faster to do the key derivation, so there's a thousand times better. Um, but you can also do really innovative things like if you pay 10 euros a month, you only get a million rounds of the key derivation. If you pay 15 euros a month, you get 3 million rounds in the key derivation. So there's a lot of innovative things blockchain is opening up for us here. 
Um, the BitFi, another really great wallet, uh, was unhackable, which didn't work out very well, so you can read that. That's a John McAfee kind of sponsored product, so it's a little interesting to read about. All right, so that's a quick motivation why we want to care about blockchain. Um, so what is blockchain? So blockchain really has two aspects to it. So the first part is the block. So this is your standard concrete masonry unit block, um, available in this case from Canada, so we're using imperial measurements here. Um, you also have your chain. So this is your standard number four straight link chain. Um, there's a lot of variations of chain and blocks that you can, you can go through. But this is your, your basic setup here. Um, how you might use it, so we have a voting system. We need to secure this. This is a big problem. Um, someone could steal it, so if you had a very heavy block, you could chain it to the voting machine, and it would be very difficult to steal. So these are really very useful products that you can have here. Um, the interesting thing is, although it's uh, in October, you know, this is the, the history is very wrong in this, because everyone credits the initial blockchain release. But in fact, several months before that, and you can go back and check this out, this is legit, um, in May 2008, H. Simpson had an implementation of blockchain used for defensive purposes. So this is the real motivation behind blockchain. It was sort of stolen and popularized later, um, but this is the real history of it here. All right, so this is full-size blockchain. What about embedded blockchain? So we're talking IoT, automotive, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, we need something smaller, something that we can embed in our product. So this is an example, I have one here, um, of like an embedded blockchain, right? So this is what you can fit in your product itself. Now we're very lucky, the security aspects of this actually scale very well. So we can use research um, from existing uh, threat models on full-size blockchain. So you can attack the chain or the block, as you might expect. Um, and there's quite a bit of research, so you have the concrete masonry unit, the CMU. Um, there's a lot of research around what is the compressive strength, how much you know, weight can it hold. There's a problem though, and security people will recognize this. It's done in laboratory conditions. Um, so it doesn't take attackers into consideration. And we have attacks like um, attacks during transport. So if it's incorrectly transported, unlike in this diagram here, the device is weakened and when you install it, the security level is much lower than you expected. Um, salt usage is a huge problem. So salt will corrode both the chain and salt during the curing process of the concrete or if mixed in with the water will really weaken the concrete. Um, also there's new and novel attacks that are rarely considered. Um, so you know, hammer drills, liquid nitrogen, people with access to Home Depot um, are all new attacks that aren't really rigorously considered in the literature. Um, so yeah, this is just me. I, I, I know people here are really into hardware security, and I thought I'd bring this kind of feel to your attention because it builds on a body of existing work, you know, started by H. Simpson, as I said, um, and it's been scaled down to the embedded blockchain. There's a lot of work needed on security threats, understanding what these threats are, and how we might move forward in the embedded blockchain space. Thank you very much. Good evening. My talk is the new sec uh, secure scholar multiplication algorithms. Nowadays, I received one question from my boss. How to obtain a secret key in crypto systems? Uh, usually, I answered my boss. Uh, we obtain the secret key by black box attack or uh, size channel attacks. Then my boss uh, asked again, what is the size channel attacks? Wow. So I, I answered, uh, I explained the side channel attacks through the real world scenarios. Because my boss do not understand side channel attacks scenarios. So uh, Sweet Melon, uh, has a good uh, special uh, special uh, 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 sweet melon have a special characteristics. Uh, the first is the appearance, and the next the uh, sound. Uh, this sound is uh, the size channel information. Then my boss is understand the size channel text. In the side channel of text, there are two characteristics, uh, categories 
First is the uh, single trace attack, and the next the uh, multi trace attacks. Uh, especially single trace attacks are more uh, practical and powerful than multi trace attacks against the uh, uh, scalar multiplications. The oldest and well known attack is the simple power analysis. Uh, this analysis is applica applicable for uh, binary method, which is the uh, origin of uh, scalar multiplications. The next uh, new two uh, single trace attacks are called uh, collision attack and bit, key bit dependent attacks. Uh, also apply, applied uh, for uh, all other scalar multiplications. ECDSA has been used in various protocols, browsers, and the crypto libraries, and uh, other some uh, solutions, uh, such as FIDO and the blockchains. Our company also have uh, uh, good solutions, the FIDO and the blockchains. Uh, but ECDSA have uh, uh, had uh, some uh, attack results because the scalar multiplication is the main operations of ECDSA. Uh, my company, uh, uh, we, our team uh, already uh, designed the uh, new scalar multiplications. Uh, this scalar multiplication named uh, triple SM TSM. This uh, scalar multiplication already uh, completes the uh, theoretical security analysis and the experimental security analyst with Kunmin University and uh, third party security evaluation through the ISPEC conference. This paper will be presented. Uh, two weeks later in Tokyo. Uh, our uh, scalar multiplication has, has, a, has a, three uh, main features. First, our uh, scalar multiplication uh, do not any scalar recording method. And next, uh, our scalar multiplication only uh, used uh, point addition operation, even though all other uh, scalar multiplication algorithms use both addition and doubling uh, operations. Finally, we use only the same size of a secret parameter, but with uh, some uh, big public parameters. In the ISPEC uh, conference, our paper only described the countermeasure for random scalar multiplication algorithms, but now we uh, prepared uh, extended paper uh, with uh, a countermeasure for chosen scalar multiplication and the optimization method. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Helena Hanshu from Rambus. Uh, I also happen to be the uh, Security Standing Committee Chair of an organization called uh, RISC-V Foundation. So this is a very simple call to action. Uh, RISC-V, for those of you who don't know it, it's a foundation which is a nonprofit corporation controlled entirely by its members. It has today over 115 member organizations that includes companies, universities, but you can also join as an individual. Um, and the goal here is to drive forward the adoption and implementation of the free and open RISC-V instruction set architecture. I repeat, free and open, very important. Uh, this was authored, among others, by David Patterson, who um, you might know as a t last 2017 Turing Award winner. Um, and so today there's two documents available for everybody to look at and to use and to build processors with. Uh, an open source risk 5 instruction set architecture as well as a draft privilege spec. So with the, the word privilege, we're getting a little bit closer to the theme, which is security. 
Um, and so earlier this year, uh, the foundation had the good idea to create a dedicated security standing committee, which means to them security is now very important and they're looking for people like all of you to join and help us build something secure on top of this. Um, so it includes today already 30 plus members in the security committee. You can read the names here. They're all public on the website. Uh, but please keep in mind, it's not easy to build secure processors and everything so far has always been proprietary. This is the first time in history that a foundation was created and they were trying to do it openly. All right, so, so far, what have we been able to do? Well, we've started by creating two uh, subgroups. One of them is dealing with cryptographic extensions to the instruction set architecture, so looking at things to efficiently run a yes or a public key cryptography. What do we need to add to those instructions to be able to run faster? And the other one is trusted execution environments. Um, we also collaborate with the privileged architecture spec group, um, and we look at vector extensions and how to achieve security on top of this. So with the advent of, I'm looking at you, Spectre, Meltdown, Foreshadow, et cetera, this is the perfect time to join. It's the perfect time to try and do it the right way from the beginning. Uh, how to build open source secure processors is the question, the answer. I don't know quite yet, but please help find out. Um, all the Rescribe Foundation adopted specs are open and free, again. Uh, and so this is a call to action. Please join us, help us make it the right way uh, from the start. And with that, you can read a couple of press releases and announcement on the RISC-V website. I've tried to identify the right color of t-shirt, but I couldn't quite um, pick between yellow and orange this time. So yeah, it doesn't exactly match the color, but it doesn't matter. OK, join us. Thank you. Yeah, hello everybody. Eli and I would like to make a short announcement. We already heard that uh, it's 20th edition of chess, and next year will be the 10th edition of Corsade. And it will be in Darmstadt. And yeah, I think Ilya, you also want to say something about it? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's the 10th uh, anniversary in Darmstadt. Uh, the um, idea of Corsade is to bring together practitioners and also people from academia, both on the defensive and on the offensive, or attackers and designers, if you want to say uh, it like this. So this event is more focused on uh, uh, fault attacks and side channel uh, attacks. Uh, so it is a nice, let's say, um, focused or more focused compared with chess event. The, uh, it will be in Darmstadt, the same place as uh, the first edition was. Deadline is December 1st, and uh, yes, we will have it. Uh, we will have your submissions reviewed, and then we will hopefully have a great event. So, thank you. Good evening. Uh, today's my presentation topic is something that is little can often have great power. Subtitle is Kibit Dependent Attack on Scala Multiplication Using a Single Trace. As side channel analysis become more powerful, various countermeasures to less them have been studied. For example, countermeasures to eliminate patterns of data dependent on the conditional branch statistical characteristic according to intermediate value or interrelationship between data have been studied. However, no countermeasure have been taken into account for the secure design of the qubit check page, although the private qubits are directly loaded during the check page. Since the private qubit value is extracted and stored in the variable, the private key can be exposed if the vulnerability is found to exist. Uh, to tell the conclusion first, uh, I can extract private key bits using a single trace because the power consumption is related to the DI value. Uh, we can distinguish traces of the qubit check page into two groups depend on the qubit value. Uh, we refer to this attack as qubit dependent attack. 
Uh, we consider binary scalar multiplication algorithms which are resistant against SPA and DPA. In particular, our target algorithms are based on regular algorithms protected by intermediate data randomization. Therefore, we suppose that an attacker is ability to use a single trace rather than use numerous traces. Uh, the first experimental platform is a hardware implementation on a Sasebo G2 FPGA board. The second one is a software implementation on an AVR microcontroller. We use power consumption traces and electromagnetic traces. Uh, we summarize power consumption properties as follows. Electromagnetic analysis is similar to the power analysis. Therefore, we describe focusing on the power analysis. There, uh, in hardware implementations, power consumption in the qubit check phase is associated with the Hamming distance between two consecutive bits, di plus one and di. For example, when the private qubits are 10011, Power consumption is associated with the Hamming distance 1010 between two consecutive bit values. Uh, in particular, in hardware implementation of FPA resistant regular algorithms, the operations are executed in parallel, so register to be accessed and the DI value are determined uh, simultaneously. Hence, Power consumption when checking the DI value is also affected by the Hamming distance between the register addresses using two consecutive loops. Thus, in addition to property one, property three occurs in hardware implementations. This is our experiment result. We attack the Montgomery Lopez DAB ladder algorithm protected by scalar multiplication. Experimental results show that the private qubit can be recovered with over 96% success rate using only a single power consumption trace and the electromagnetic trace. Second, experiments on software implementation, our target algorithms are composed based on the qubit check functions of embedded TLS and OpenSSL. Here, we distinguish traces into two groups according to the Hamming weight of the eye. As a result, secret scalar bits can be recovered over 90-30% success rate, uh, especially if we attack power consumption trace using the leakage associated with reference register addresses, the success rate is 100%. Thus, we need to apply countermeasure in this case. If you have any questions, refer to following articles. Thanks for your attention. Hi. Um, some of you might be wondering in the audience, um, does Frodo fit on an embedded device? Can you fault to lithium? Does New Hope suffer a cold boot attack? Does hardware designs of code-based schemes exist? Or worry no more. May I present PQC Zoo, a website created to um, store uh, NIST uh, post-quantum uh, candidates um, with regards to microcontroller designs, hardware designs, and side-channel analysis. Here's just an example of the side-channel analysis page where we uh, store the information, where uh, a reader can like, be further pointed towards. Uh, so yeah, as I said, this is the breakdown of the website. So you can just visit this URL and you can find all the information about all the schemes, that have, that all the implementations that have been done so far. So far, we have a lot of representations of lattice-based schemes and some based on code-based schemes. And as you can see, there's a really underrepresented classes here on the other types of um, post-quantum crypto schemes. And looking at nobody in particular, there are some more uh, research, there's more research here that can be submitted to the website, so please feel free. Um, all you need to do to submit to the website is have a GitHub account and um, essentially do a pull request on the, uh, the data table, where, whether it's hardware, software, or side channel analysis. Um, I'll be... Um, notified of that and then I can um, accept the pull request. 
Um, so if you need any more information, um, go to the website. There's an about section to follow um, to actually submit your, your research, or you can catch me here or send me an email. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our first session. Uh, we, let's take a, a short break and be here at 9.05. So I was supposed to have uh, one more co-presenter, but I don't see uh, Emmanuel here, so I guess I will start unless Emmanuel will come to the stage. Okay. So during the dinner, this dinner, I uh, was telling people that I'm going to announce the Chess CTF award tonight, and they were asking me, okay, but what is the Chess CTF? So many people were surprised. So I'm just gonna briefly uh, remind you what the Chess CTF was about. And in fact, we, don't, we did not have just one challenge, we had two challenges. One was the challenge where we published some traces and people had to uh, uh, capture the flag and then the one that captured most flags were the winners. But the other uh, challenge behind the scenes were actually um, a battle between deep learning techniques that we hear so much about lately and classic side channel analysis. And we wanted to find out which of the techniques is more successful in extracting keys. So we had two CTFs and not one. Um, the first CTF was sponsored by uh, Riskure, so the one that is um, um, with challenges and having the prize, and we have here the first prize would be a Nintendo for the winner. And the second competition, looking at the state of the art between the uh, deep learning versus classic side channel analysis is actually uh, uh, sponsored by Reassure. It's a Horizon 2020 project. And we also have the help of Google, who uh, hosted our traces uh, such that uh, we, you could download the, uh, the trace set in a timely manner. So that being said, some quick stats, because we like stats. So there were 58 players that were registered for the CTF. The CTF actually ran for 70 days, and we put out their uh, 35 gigabytes of data for you to, uh, to mine. Um, there were seven rounds to this challenge. Uh, we looked at key recovery for both profile and non-profile challenges. Uh, there were three uh, types of, uh, there were three tray sets, so a hardware DES engine, software AES engine, and an RSA. And you can see how many uh, submission we had correct, how many submission we had, and how many of these submission were actually correct submissions. Now, here you see that we have uh, submissions for both the classic profiling and deep learning, but in fact, we suspect that many of the submissions, um, many of the flags that were captured were actually um, uh, obtained with one technique and then were uh, submitted to both sides because I, I think uh, the player thought that they will get double points, but that was not the case. And <laughs> Um, so we, we suspect that that is the case because the, the timestamp uh, between the submissions was very, very short. Not enough time to run uh, uh, classic side channel analysis and then uh, run your neural network. So I'm not sure how accurate uh, the, the distribution between the two columns is. Uh, second, we also used a model uh, which for, for taking the points, which was winner takes it all. That means that not only uh, you had to solve the challenges, but to get the points, you had to be the first one who submitted the flag. So um, that was it. So let's see, who were the winners to the first competition? So the, first, the third place um, goes to uh, the teams that are known as Coder Space 2018, IDFIX, Zotkin, and um, um, yeah, a name which is very hard to pronounce. <laughs> um, at the time, uh, I, when I made this slide this morning, because I submitted them on time, um, I did not know who the teams are. Uh, so I emailed them and said, if you want to, be, to have a public recognition, let me know and I will uh, announce it. So I only know about the identity of one team, and um, that is uh, Idefix, who is actually uh, Idemia uh, security team that won the third place. So. Uh, let's give them a big... Uh... <laughs> and for the others, uh, if, uh, uh, if you contact me, then I will make sure you get something like this, a certificate. 
Okay, now uh, the second place, actually they solved, they were very to the point. They solved two challenges out of the seven challenges. They were very focused and they submitted the flag for these two challenges, the first, and this was the AES challenges. So they got a total of 1,500 points. And the team that won this is um, AGSJWS, but actually the members of the team are uh, here with us. And uh, Mr. Werner Schindler will actually get the, uh, the second prize. And now, the winner of the challenge <clears throat> and of this Nintendo Switch is the team that solved actually seven of, six of the seven challenges. They, oh, oh no, no. <laughs> they submitted the, uh, the first flag for four out of the six challenges and they got a total of 3,000 points. And the winner is the Hot 8 team. And uh, for them, the prize will be, uh, um, I will hand the prize over to Mr. Matthias Wagner, who will then uh, hand it over to them. Uh, would you like to say something about that? Yeah, that's yeah, thanks guys. So this was my former team when they were still working in NXP, but they all moved on for some unfortunate reasons. Um, and uh, this is really huge, and I, I, I love that team. I wish they would come back, but maybe they will at some point. Um, so I will pass this on at some point, but uh, only when they come back. Thanks so much. <laughs> so this is the, the winner's uh, board. Um, and then, for the second competition, we had, I told you that there is a competition between deep learning versus classic SCA. Well, at this point in time, the jury is still out of who the winner is. Uh, we will publish, so the, the data set that was used for this uh, competition will be public for you all to try out. And uh, it would be great if you let us know um, which one of them works for you. So with this, um, yeah, this was the Chess 2018. Oh. This is it. Uh, before we proceed with the program, this was found in the catering room. So whoever this belongs to, uh, come find us. It's right here on the podium. Sorry. There you go, no.
Good evening. Hi, I'm Song Hyunjin, studying in Korea University. This time, I will talk about simple size channel analysis on plug and play quantum key di distribution system. This suggests that we need to consider side channel analysis even in quantum secure system. To exchange the key secret key securely through an insecure channel, we use key exchange protocols such as DPLMAN or elliptic curve DPLMAN. Of course, if you can snatch ciphertext in this channel, to prevent if from snatch, this snatching ac action, QKD is ongoing active research area. The security of QKD is rise in quantum physics through the fundamental theory of quantum physics, if you can no longer snatch or even drop the quantum channel between Alice and Bob. QKD can guarantee <coughs> whether someone is even dropping the channel or not. This may, this may seem unreal or too theoretical, but recent advances made QKD to live out of the lab. The DARPA project, or Tokyo QKD network, Experiment on QKD has been performed in distance over 100 kilometer. More recently, China has launched a mission to create a QKD channel between China and Austria. However, also QKD is quantum secure. We always need to consider other weak points like side channel analysis. In the QKD system, the QKD equipment is mainly implemented in FPGA. The time inside the channel analysis had already performed on pop side, so the constant time QKD is proposed. A plug, and, plug and play QKD system is another form of QKD implementation that prevents timing attack. As we all know, we only need to know 1 bit, 0 and 1 in the secret key. To simplify, the bits have two kinds of bases. Uh, Two bits, two bases, means that we need to know four kinds of states as in the table. To implement these four kinds of zero and one, we give four kinds of voltage to a photon. Which depending on different voltage, this means leakage. We had an effort to check the vulnerability in the QKD system from Professor Hope in Korea University, as expected, we, had, we were able to obtain four different trays that directly refer to four different types of qubits. To sum up, we also need to consider size channel analysis even, con even in QKD. Thank you. Uh, it's a short announcement for the hiring at IOTEX. Uh, IOTEX is a very young blockchain startup uh, with a core team located at the Silicon Valley, United States, and multiple small task forces uh, currently distributed globally. Uh, those small task forces uh, are being added into the uh, core team in a pen-only and uh, distributed manner, more like how blockchain works. Uh, we we, we are currently building the next generation blockchain platform for the IoT applications and to power large scale and uh, decentralized IoT applications. Uh, we're currently hiring the software engineers and the cryptography engineers. Uh, it's a unique opportunity uh, to use, uh, use all of your knowledge in cryptography distributed system and the game theory uh, to build something which has significant impact uh, for people's life. Uh, please check our website, iotex.io, for more information. Uh, if you are interested in our projects and would like to take that adventure with us, uh, please send your resume to hello at iotex.io. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, this is a short announcement of the ECC 2018.
And ACC 2018, uh, the 22nd workshop on editive cryptography will be held on November 19th to 21st at Osaka, Japan, the second largest city in Japan. Uh, the ECC is an annual workshop dedicated to the study of every club cryptography and related areas. Since the first ECC workshop, ECC has broadened its state, uh, scope beyond elective cryptography and now covers a wide range of areas within modern cryptography. Uh, the ECC workshop have invited presentations only. Presentations tend to give an overview of emerging or established areas of modern cryptography often combined with new research findings. The ECC workshop is accompanied uh, by a two-day autumn school on elective curve cryptography for graduate students involved in this area. The school will take place on November 19th and 18th, just before the main workshop. Um, and here is the list of the great speakers for the workshop and the school. And the presentation title that will be announced. And the details of the workshop is shown at the URL. The first one is about the generic ECC workshop, and the last one is the ECC for this year. And, and the registration is now open, and the early board registration fee is applied until October 9th. Thank you. Okay, so this is also a very short one, and Peter submitted it and put me on stage, but okay. So uh, I guess what he meant is like, if you're up for even more great talks, uh, good food, a nice company, and above all, very smooth organization, you should come to our summer school next June, which is not 20th, but 6th edition, so I guess we're doing pretty fine. And the challenge here is to click very quickly on this link and to find out who's speaking there and what's going on. Thanks. Okay, I'll start with a small disclaimer. I'm going to show some things that are quite ridiculous, but everything is real. So my talk is about Tesla Model S, and specifically the Tesla Model S key fob. As you can see, it looks quite simple. Um, we have the entire PCB on the left, and an X-ray picture on the right. There's a simple microcontroller that communicates with a transponder that stores a key. So what we found is that they actually are using a 40-bit cipher that um, <laughs> accepts a 40-bit challenge and returns a 24-bit response. There's also no... <laughs> <laughs> they also have no mutual authentication in their authentication protocol. So we built a small 5.4 terabyte um, lookup table that allows us to recover the cryptographic key in two seconds. This is what the uh, proof of concept hardware looks like. So it's a simple power bank, a Raspberry Pi, Proximal 3 to do low frequency stuff, and Yardstick 1 to do high frequency stuff. So we tested our attack on Tesla Model S, but we also found out that the system was actually developed by Pectron, which also makes systems for McLaren, Karma, and Triumph. If you happen to have a McLaren, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> so we first notified Tesla about one year ago, and um, from June onwards this year, they are actually using new key fobs, and they introduced some software updates that people that own a Model S can enable to, ha to help stop the attack. And Elon Musk approves. <laughs> <laughs> so if you would like some more information, um, we have a, a blog post up on our website. I will be doing the poster sessions from now on. You can check us out on Twitter. There's an article on Wired. Um, and if you happen to have a Tesla Model S, I would be happy to show you a live demo. And now we have a small video.
Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm John Kelsey. I'm going to give you an update on what we're doing at NIST. So lightweight crypto standardization. You can see we've got a plan to standardize some lightweight crypto algorithms. Um, we made a call for proposals that finally came out. So you can um, go look at our web page and find the call for proposals and all sorts of other information. And you can also subscribe to the mailing list if you're interested. Threshold crypto. So this is an area that we've not had standards in before, and we're looking at doing standards in this. So we have a draft NISTER. That, a NISTER is basically NIST speak for a white paper. So we have a, basically a white paper on threshold schemes for crypto. And we'd like public comments. So if you have thoughts about this, this is an area of interest of yours, um, let us know what you think. There's also, a, con there's also a, a workshop in March. And so you can see all the contact information here. Um, the PQC stuff is continuing apace. You can see kind of where we are. Next year, we're going to have a workshop, or we're going to have the, the conference um, co-located with crypto. So it's a good excuse if, you want, if you're interested in either of those to come to both. Um, this is already, the, the comment period has just closed on this. This is our plans to basically to get rid of triple des as much as possible. If you have strong feelings about this though, we will still read your comments. So if you're in an industry where getting rid of triple des, FIPS approval for triple des is going to like utterly screw you, then please let us know so we can take you into account. Um, and you can see with the email address for that. Um, 890B, um, it's come out as of the beginning of this year, the final version. Um, we're, we've, seen, we've found some bugs and we're in the process of correcting them. So this is something new that we're able to do now is issue a corrected version with errata. That's not something where you could revise the whole document, but if you found like a typo in a formula, you can fix it. Um, and so I'm also giving a talk at FTDC on, uh, on Thursday. So if you're interested, come listen to me and you can hear more about uh, 90B. Um, the NIST Beacon is now switched over to a new format. We've got two organizations, Universidad de Santiago, I think, is the, not Chile, um, and in Metro, which is the Brazilian, sort of Brazilian version of NIST, or maybe if you're Brazilian, you think NIST is the American version of them. So um, this is, you know, these are both organizations that are, have stood up beacons, they're planning to uh, follow our, our protocol or our, our format. And there's a NISTER coming soon that will describe the new format, and you can see you can find this at, at the, this URL. Um, also, FIPS 186, a digital signature standard. This is under revision. Soon it will be going out for public comment. So if you're interested in this, and you probably are, uh, digital signatures matter for pretty much everybody, this is a good, you know, when this comes out fairly soon, it'll be good to, to get your comments in. Um, and one of the interesting things here is moving the elliptic curves to their own document rather than having them as part of the signature standard, even though they get used for other things. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, my name is Christoph, and this is a serious talk. Um, so I won't be funny at all. And if I'm funny, then it's an incident, and I want to apologize for that. Um, this talk is about uh, CIFA, which are statistically ineffective fault attacks. So, uh, suppose you want to protect a simple block cipher call against implementation attacks, what do you do? Um, yeah, you mask this stuff against side channel attacks, and then you add some uh, error detection capabilities, like multiple execution of this stuff, and see if the right thing for it, uh, comes out, and then you end up with this piece, basically. So, but it turns out, with the help of CIFA, um, you can attack this piece using uh, single faults per execution of this stuff. Um, and what's also cool about CIFA is that the um, effort of the attack typically does not increase with the protection order or the degree of redundancy. So what is CIFA? Um, it's the union of statistical fault attacks and ineffective fault attacks. And basically, there exist uh, two papers. Uh, one of them, which contains the basic, is actually the last session of chess conference. Um, and the paper, which explains why this stuff also works on mask implementation, uh, appears at AsiaCrypt. Um, so if you're thinking, okay, it might be hard and might be quite special uh, location to fault uh, in order to mount the CIFA, um, then I have good news. 
So, in principle, for this certain uh, implementation of mask AES in software, um, it turns out if you can stack a byte to zero or always set a byte to zero, then around 70% of the um, instructions are susceptible to an attack. Um, I also have to point out that uh, we do not exploit any weakness in this implementation or that this implementation is not weak. Um, the reason why we have chosen this specific implementation of mask AES is that there are not many uh, mask implementations out there. Um, which are publicly accessible and uh, good and useful, so probably people should or should change that. Um, and uh, if you think, okay, always setting a byte to zero is a quite hard task to do, um, what you can also do is, uh, for instance, flip one bit and have a successful attack, or um, set one bit to zero, or always randomize one bit, or flip a whole byte, or set one byte to zero, or randomize one byte, or even skip an instruction. So how does this thing work? Um, I do not have time to tell you. So if you want to know this, uh, then you uh, have to read the paper or to come to the talk. Thank you very much. So uh, let's go back in time. So, anybody knows this kind of computer? CRS80 yeah? from uh, 78. So, would you use that still now? Probably not. Maybe, maybe for fun. Huh? But uh, the crypto of that time, what is that? What would you use in 1978 for uh, crypto? DAS. Would you use DAS now? Yeah, but the banks are still using this. Huh? So you want to be in that crowd? Do you want to investigate this? Maybe not. So let's, let's go uh, make a jump in time. So we go to 98. Huh? So anybody remembers that kind of computer? I had one like that, a compact. And 98, what would be the crypto then? No, yeah, it was still this, but there was something new coming up in 98. A yes contest, that would be a yes. Yeah? So there's a lot of evolution, but you see it's still, yeah, it's not quite modern. No? It's like uh, some old stuff. But we do a lot of investigations on a yes. Okay, let's make another jump in time. We go to 2008. What happened in 2008? It was the start of the Chartres competition. So, a lot of evolution, and we got to also a different model. We're not looking at PCs anymore, we're now looking at other devices. This uh, thing, uh, this Blackberry, then was really hot. Huh? That was like the thing to have here. You know? Um, that was the start of permutation based crypto. But would you investigate that kind of stuff? Would you do research on that or use that? Maybe yes, maybe no, but that's, that's, the, that's the modern age. Huh? Do you want to know what this crypto looks like in that age? Well, then you come to this uh, workshop that will take uh, place in, I think it's about a month from now, in um, Milano, Italy. Yeah. So it's a day on permutation-based crypto, and we have a number of speakers. So uh, you will recognize Christoph de Braunig, who just spoke just before me. But there's a lot of uh, experts speaking about it. And uh, I uh, invite you to visit the website and subscribe. It's cheap and it's very uh, educational. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Diego Aranha. Until recently, I lived in Brazil. Now I work at Aarhus University in Denmark. So there was like a, an upgrade. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have friends in the audience. Um, so I don't want to turn this into um, Alcoholic Anonymous style meeting, but I have to admit that for the past six years, I've been slightly obsessed about the insecurity of Brazilian voting machines. So um, the reason for that is 140 million voters use these machines every two years, and they have been in production for more than two decades. Uh, and this is a paperless voting machine, so there are no meaningful ways to verify that the results are correct. 
So at Chess 2012, I gave a short uh, um, talk at the RUM session about how we, we hacked these machines for the first time. So we essentially had to only do this, to scan this across the code base. So we, break, we actually broke uh, the vote shuffling mechanism to break ballot secrecy, of course. And then after running this, we found this, right? And the timestamp there was printed in an official document that's kept for five years, you know, for uh, transparency reasons. So last year, we did it again. This time, we tried something slightly more sophisticated, which was this. <laughs> and then we found a cryptographic key that uh, allowed us, after a few escalation with other vulnerabilities, to manipulate the voting software. Um, so this was the key we found, the, the key protecting the file system. So we could uh, actually tell, to modify the voting software to tell the voters to vote for that radar. So, which could be a great present to Brazil, I think. Um, so I think the punchline in this is, for all governments and voting system vendors out there, elections are not really a playground for your crappy software. Get your shit together. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present uh, today a magical parallel variant of SIDH, which is a post-quantum candidate. And uh, the idea is to have a parallel version of it. So we present uh, here a variant of the super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman SIDH protocol. Uh, the variant will be run by three characters instead of Alice above. We will have Hermione instead of Alice and Ron and Harry instead of Bav. Uh, they learn uh, the Cur Curbaberto spell that transforms an elliptic curve and two magical stones in another, into another curve. So this is the way that it works. First, uh, instead of selecting a prime as usual, we will select uh, um, one prime that has uh, Hermione in one side and uh, Harry and Ron in the other side. So the way that it works is, is the following. Uh, we have uh, three bases instead of, of two bases, uh, one for Hermione, one for Harry, and one for Ron. And then Hermione works as Alice will compute uh, an isogeny from the base elliptic curve is zero. And then uh, Ron will work out uh, the, the SIDH protocol uh, from his side and will carry out the point of Harry. Then Harry will take uh, from the isogeny uh, computed by Ron and we will have this, uh, this second uh, isogeny. And then they need to exchange alls. So Harry sends an all to, to Hermione. Hermione does the same. And then uh, Hermione ends her work and computes this elliptic curve. Uh, then Ron works again, and then Harry, and finally they met here. Uh, running this variant of the SIDH pro protocol, we got a modest but noticeable uh, uh, acceleration factor of uh, about 10% in the best case, and sometimes we lose. But uh, this uh, variant is uh, really nice for uh, parallel implementations. So if you happen to have more than one core, let's say two cores, or even better, three cores, then you get an acceleration of up to 67, 1.67 acceleration factor. So this is an on-working on, on um, work, uh, and we are looking for new combinations of primes, uh, for more Montgomery-friendly primes, and to optimize the single-core version of this proposal. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. So in, in um, uh, 2017, we organized this um, white box crypto competition uh, called White Box, and we um, it was actually a tremendous event because we had like uh, 200 competitors, like nearly 100 uh, submissions. Uh, so challenge programs were submitted. We had nearly 900 uh, 
uh, breaks. And uh, so it was co-organized with crypto experts, so we developed the submission server. Uh, the server was hosted by uh, TUE, and it was sponsored by uh, Ecrypt CSA, and we thought it was a tremendous event. So uh, let's go for a second edition. So um, what we'd like to do would be to run a, um, an edition of, of Whitebox. So again, it will be um, about AES-128 uh, with no external encodings. And there will still be this uh, dual system of points with strawberry points when you, uh, that you can accumulate as long as you're not broken. And banana points, uh, strawberries being converted into bananas uh, whenever the, uh, the challenge is broken. And uh, we still uh, would like to put some limitations on the code size and execution time and so on. Uh, but there was some, some kind of feedback from the community on the rules, like uh, at some point 50 megabytes for the um, uh, C source of a challenge was too small for some people, was too large for some others. Uh, one second of execution as a limit was uh, either too slow or too fast for some people. So. Uh, there is still the, um, the Slack forum, uh, so you can go there for its, your own opinions about the, what the limitations should be. And so the tentative timeline should be, uh, so it should last for about six months in 2019. So starting beginning of February maybe, and uh, until an, end of August. But the main problem is that uh, we're looking for a volunteer or a group of volunteers who would like, would be willing to actually host the, uh, the submission server. So uh, the submission server was uh, developed by crypto experts. It's totally open source. You can find it on GitHub. And uh, we would like also to apply a few improvements so that uh, the second edition runs more smooth, smoothly, I would say, compared to the first one. So if anyone is willing to do that, uh, please uh, contact me on uh, my email address. Thanks. Um, good evening. Um, I'm the last one, so I guess I have no time limit. <laughs> so um, I've did some uh, work with a lot of cool people, which I will not enumerate because I don't have so much time. Uh, but they're very cool and cool and skillful. Um, so we've been working on the crypto analytics algorithm for uh, lattices, and we've made some progress. So. Just uh, the core idea is that saving was used to be thought of a, as a black box function. You give a lattice basis, you get a short vector, and then you insert it in the vector, and then you restart at the next position. Uh, the core idea we have is to view it as a stateful machine where um, a lot of uh, information is kept inside and can be reused from one sieve to the next, basically recycling a lot of information to amortize the cost. Um, where we have been working on implementation. Um, uh, it will be made open source. We have several sieve inside. It's highly optimized. It's parallelized. And so for designing high-level algorithm, we made an interface in Python that makes your life a bit easier. Um, and with it, we've been able to break new challenges. Um, we're about 400 times faster than the previous algorithms. Um, so stay tuned for a paper and an open source implementation and maybe more records, especially LWE challenges. Um, for what, why do you care here at Chess? Well, maybe you need to worry about NIST lattice based candidate because of this. Uh, the answer is not so much. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes our AMP session. Uh, let's thank the speakers again. And I hereby declare the AMP session over. <laughs>